It's good news to some, to others not so much. But football season has started. Hope that's not news to you. The talking heads on the sports channels and the coaches interviewed all remind us that with that game, strategy is very important. Coaches and players and all the other people that surround the game spend a great deal of time and effort developing what they hope will be a winning strategy. A winning strategy is important because each game, every team faces an opponent, often an opponent with the capability of defeating them on the field. And a good strategy can help them come out victorious. Paul, that that other Paul, says we need a winning strategy for our spiritual competition. And all our lives relate to the spiritual. We need a winning strategy spiritually because we face some powerful spiritual opponents. Paul, in wrapping things up in this letter to the Ephesians, lays out a very sobering reality. He says that we deal routinely with powerful spiritual forces of evil. Forces who are under the direction of the prince of this world, going by various names, Satan, the devil, the evil one. Now Paul reminds us in this letter that these forces have been defeated, but they haven't stopped fighting. God's victory cannot be snatched away. God's victory is is based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In the resurrection, God defeated all evil with its ultimate expression, and that was death. That victory, that resurrection cannot be undone. But the enemies of the resurrection have not surrendered yet. Powerful forces of evil overcome by Christ. And here's another bit of good news. All of Christ's followers can overcome the evil forces too. How do we do that? What can we do to not be overwhelmed or defeated by the evil forces that are around us? Well, Paul's strategy involves a picture of a first century Roman soldier. Paul describes our strategy for facing evil as he looks at this picture of the soldier that the Ephesian readers would know so well. Now, Paul describes our strategy. It's a plural term. The soldier's armor was used in concert with that of other soldiers in his unit. Paul is speaking to the church here. Obviously, the church is made up of individuals who practice what Paul prescribes. We practice it together with other Christians so that together we can be victorious over evil. A word of warning. We diminish the impact of Paul's words if we lose sight of his audience. His audience is the church as a whole. Each member is responsible to do his or her part, but Paul is talking about us as church and us as a part of the universal church. And Paul says to the church, put on the whole armor of God. This armor he's going to describe here, or does describe here, it's not our armor, it's God's armor that has been given to us to use. Now, a disclaimer, if you will. The language of armor in battle it can be dangerous in the hands of us human beings who are quick to pick up these um, terms. Uh, and through church history, we can see that the church has often aligned itself with empires and military forces, much to the church's shame. Uh, crusades and blessing armies and weapons that are used to 
wipe out parts of God's creation. So a text that seems to blend the church's faith and military force can be dangerous, both spiritually and politically. I don't think Paul is using the imagery of a soldier's armor to encourage a militaristic church. Paul is using an image that was very familiar to his readers. The Roman Empire, when they conquered a a people, they occupied that people. Every Ephesian reader, every Ephesian Christian would be very familiar with the appearance and the armor of a routine Roman soldier. They were everywhere. So Paul, like any good teacher, preacher, would try to find something that would illustrate his truth and something that would be very familiar to the hearer. And everybody there in Ephesus would recognize the parts of the soldier's equipment that Paul was talking about. And so Paul says, we are challenged to take up, to strengthen ourselves, to clothe ourselves with God's armor, with God's strength. We've got a choice here. We don't have to do this. That's often the case with other aspects of our Christian walk. We can choose to do it or choose not to. But Paul says if we want to be victorious in facing the forces of evil, we will take up God's armor. We will put it on. And by taking on the armor of God, the church becomes active in the struggle against evil forces. Please note, we are called to confront demonic forces. We are not called to demonize people with whom we disagree. It's so easy, isn't it, to label those with whom we disagree, to label them as evil, and sort of self-righteously dehumanize those that we find on the other side of the political, social, or religious spectrum from us. Kind of like Ashley said, the key to service for whatever role we are in in the church is love. We don't have to agree with other people, but Jesus calls us to love them. Now Paul describes evil as coming to us as evil schemes. Uh, sometimes the picture of, of Satan is this guy in a red suit with a pitchfork. You, you recognize that picture? Well, Paul's not talking about that. Notice he, he, he says evil schemes. Uh, evil often comes in a deceptively attractive form rather than in some form that's obviously repulsive. I would be afraid of a guy in a red suit with a pitchfork. Run from it. But many of the temptations that have come my way have not been in red suits and pitchforks. (laughs) It's deceptively attractive. So what about the armor of God that equips us to deal with the evil schemes in in a healthy, godly manner? Just just a few details about the armor. I'm not going to try to unpack all of this, but just a few things that, that I think stand out. Paul says in verse 14, Stand, therefore, take an unwavering stance, before an opponent. If your, foot, your favorite football team comes on the field Saturday afternoon or Saturday night, it'll be Saturday night for me, if they come on the field Saturday night and the other team comes on the field and your team turns and runs back to the locker room, are you going to be encouraged by that? They've given up. Paul says, take an unwavering stance before the evil forces doesn't stop there. Fasten the belt of God's truth around your waist. We are responsible to know God's truth. He says, wrap your core, the center of your body. Those of you who are into health and fitness know that core muscles are so essential for balance and for general health and for strength. And Paul says, protect your core, the core of your being, with God's truth. It will protect the core of your life. Every Christian virtue you can think of is exercised through the sphere of truth. And then he says, put on the breastplate of righteousness. In Psalm 23, the psalmist says that God directs us in paths of righteousness for His namesake. Well, this righteousness covers our heart and our back. It protects our vital organs, spiritually speaking. 
if we are walking right paths, as Psalm 23 describes, we are not likely to be attacked by a guilty conscience. Our ability to measure up to God's righteousness is a favorite attack point of these evil enemy forces. You're trying to do something and in your mind, how dare you do that? Who do you think you are to be in service? Who do you think you are to stand and teach and preach? Who do you think you are to carry out that function of the church? Why, do you remember what you did? And when we walk in paths of righteousness, those attacks fail because we know that we have been forgiven when we were not righteous and we have been pronounced righteous by God. Verse 15, Paul says, As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. Shoes. That's, that's our foundation, isn't it? The foundation of our walking and our moving and our working and our functioning and our accomplishing thing. The gospel is the foundation for our lives. For our lives individually and for our lives together as the church. We know the content of the gospel message, the life and the teaching of Jesus, the truth Paul mentions in verse 14. Those foot soldiers, those Roman foot soldiers wore solid shoes so they could be on a firm footing in the event of battle. We are firmly entrenched in the gospel of peace. Our battle is fought with the truth of the good news of Jesus Christ. It's a message of peace, first for the individual heart, as we know the peace of being forgiven. It is a message of peace for the church as we come together united in Christ. It is a message of peace we take to our world as we share with them the good news of Jesus and His saving grace. With all of these things, Paul says in verse 16, take the shield of faith. Guard your body with this shield. The Roman soldier used a shield which was made of of leather-covered wood, and this, of course, protect against the enemy archers. But sometimes the arrows coming from the enemy were set afire. And if they became lodged in the shield, guess what happens to a leather-covered wooden shield that's been struck by a flaming arrow? It catches fire. Now that leaves the soldier in a precarious position. You drop the shield, and you open yourself up to all kinds of attacks. You hold the shield, and you may be burned to death. But Paul tweaks this armor, just a little bit of this description, and he says the shield that we have, the shield of faith, does not have the limitation of the leather-covered wooden armor of the Roman soldier. The shield of faith can withstand even the flaming arrows of the evil one. It's something to know about these shields that the Roman soldiers carried the individual shields overlapped the soldier on the side. So as they walked in formation, side by side, the shield covered the soldier holding it, and it covered a third of the upper body of the soldier to his side. And the soldier to his other side, that shield covered him and covered the soldier to his side. So they were all in this together. In essence, the shields interlocking. Church, we march together and we protect each other with God's shield of faith, the shield of faith you carry. When I see your faith in action, I am encouraged to practice my faith. When I see you trusting God for the protection you need in the face of evil, then I am encouraged to trust God in a similar manner. The shield of faith. We cannot stand firm, as Paul calls us to do, by ourselves. We need a community of Christian faith to continue for us to be strengthened by the shared faith of sisters and brothers. And this strengthening is a lifelong process. It's never finished continuing to be strengthened by those that we see carrying out their faith. Even Paul, the apostle, this great spiritual hero, needed these Christians to practice their faith to encourage him. Specifically, he asked them to pray for his faithfulness and his boldness as he proclaimed the gospel. He told them, pray in the Spirit. He wrote to the Romans, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. 
He told the Ephesian Christians, pray in the Spirit. Prayer is an appropriate, perhaps the most appropriate way for us to deal with evil situations or evil times. And he uses the phrases to pray in every prayer and supplication. That is with the large things and the small things. The things we know we cannot handle, they're too big for us. The things that we might be tempted to say, oh, that's too small, I don't need to bother God with. Paul says pray about everything, large and small. Keep alert, always persevere in praying for other believers. Someone told me this morning, they pray for me every Sunday. I'm thankful for that. Somebody else tell me you're going to pray for me Monday, okay? <laughs> let's pray for each other. And let's pray for more than just physical health. We should pray for each other's physical health. But let's pray for the spiritual struggles, the battles. That means we learn to trust each other so we can share what some of those battles are. Paul says, pray for me, the other Paul. Pray for me so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. Pray for those who publicly proclaim the message of Christ. Pray for those who are very quietly in places where they cannot be public. But they are there quietly proclaiming the message of Christ. And with boldness, he says in verse 20. Now let's jump back, and I'm about to wrap it up. In verse 17, Paul says, take the helmet, the helmet of salvation. Confident of your salvation means your mind is not disturbed by the attacks of the evil one. Now notice up to now, all of these things that Paul has mentioned, all of these weapons, all of these armors, all of these parts of armor, they're all defensive. They're all to protect against an attack. But he mentions one offensive weapon, and that is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Notice that the Spirit of God uses Scripture. And if the Holy Spirit needs to use Scripture, how much more do I need to use it? And the Spirit uses the Scripture that we have put in our hearts and our minds. The Spirit uses that to protect us and to carry the fight to the enemy. It's not your word or your intellect or even your commitment. It is the Word. We don't have time to look at it this morning, but uh, write down Matthew 4, 1 through 11. That's the, the, the account of Jesus' temptation after his baptism. He went into the, into the desert and uh, fasted and prayed for 40 days. And there he was tempted greatly by the devil. And he countered every one of those temptations. Check me out. He countered every one of those temptations with Scripture. Jesus defeated in that setting. He defeated the evil one with the words of Scripture. Our offensive weapon, and not to be offensive, but to take the fight to the enemy is the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Now what does it mean that we have this armor available to us? A couple of thoughts on that. Because we have God's armor, it means that we have a, a defense against evil schemes, whether they are behind the scenes or a direct assault. Uh, we, we, we can't, because Paul uses this imagery here, reminds us that that we're, we're not to be complacent or ignore the daily reality of evil. It's in our world. It's in our lives too often. But with the armor of God, we are prepared for the attacks when they come. Now, having the armor of God available also means that I can't help it is not a proper response to temptation. We've got God's armor. We can help it. Our goal, Paul says, is to stand firm being faithful to God's purpose for us. Now, if you've never worn the armor, if you've never really gotten into the study of the Word and, and tried to make it a living reality in your life, then that armor will feel stiff at first. It will seem to limit your movement. And it does at times. But believers who put on the armor daily, who wear it regularly, who use it, become accustomed to the armor and in fact would never go out without it because they would feel completely unclothed. If we don't wear the armor regularly, if we don't tie it up with the belt of truth, then we grow weak and are not able to use the armor even on those rare occasions we try to pick it up. 
may it may we never may we never be caught out without the armor of God on us individually or as a unified community of faith. When we are functioning, as Paul describes here, as one unit of God's worldwide community of faith, we are an ongoing testimony that God has already won the war with evil and has set us free. Amen? Now, I don't know if you picked up the armor. You say, I, I, I haven't put it on because I don't know Christ. I can't put on his armor, the armor that God provides. Well, today, may the Spirit of God make you aware of what is missing in your life. That's not said as a criticism or a condemnation, just as an observation. May the Spirit of God make you aware of what's missing in your life. And may you sense the Spirit drawing you to God through Christ for forgiveness and for salvation. And may you boldly reach out for that salvation. In just a moment, we're going to stand and sing a song of commitment while we're singing it. If you need to share a decision that you have made this week or if you want to prayerfully uh, walk, talk with me about a decision you're trying to make, you come and share with me and I will share with the church as appropriate what your decisions are. Let's stand and sing, please.